the Lord be with you. What a joy to, to gather together again as the body of Christ in worship, to uh, receive the Lord as he comes to us this morning in his body and blood, uh, in his word, to enjoy the fellowship uh, of brothers and sisters in Christ. We're glad that you're here uh, this morning as we worship together. A special welcome to our guests. We're glad that you've joined us this morning as well. We would be privileged if you would use one of the information cards in your pew to share more about yourself, that we then in turn could share more about the programs and ministries of our congregation. Lots going on. You can figure that out just by looking at the length of the announcements in the back of our bulletin today. Lots of different activities, uh, events, uh, studies, service opportunities, everything uh, seemingly under the sun going on. Certainly uh, invite you to check those out. We can't... Uh, verbally highlight every one of them, but there's some wonderful things going on, invite you to see those. One thing that I do want to uh, highlight this morning is following our worship service, all of our worship services this morning, uh, our elders would like to, to get to know you better. Uh, they are in charge of the spiritual care of our congregation, um, and it's much easier to care for someone when you know them a little bit. You'll notice on page 16 at the bottom of your bulletin uh, there, uh, there's a list of uh, the congregant names. Our 12 elders have gone into pairs, six teams, um, and are each responsible for a section uh, of uh, the alphabet of our congregation. Um, they would like to get to know you. So from that list, you should be able to figure out uh, who your uh, two elders are. Uh, since I'm a Mueller, Mueller comes after Molino and before Scaltetti, uh, so my two elders are Tom Hartle uh, and Linda Davies. Um, whoever that is that's your elder, they would like to get to know you. They're all going to be in the fellowship hall following worship, um, and we're kindly asking, if you could just, following worship, make a right turn and another right turn instead of a quick left. Um, go into the fellowship hall, introduce yourself to your elder, uh, let them introduce themselves to you, and just get to know you a little bit better. That way, if there's anything in the future that they can do to, to care or uh, support you in your spiritual walk with Christ, uh, they'll know you a little better. So again, please uh, meet and greet your elder following worship this morning. As we worship this morning, and indeed Larry uh, mentions that we will be talking uh, about stewardship. How do we use those uh, gifts that, that God has uh, given to us, um, and we'll be focusing on that for the next uh, three weeks as we talk about uh, stewardship. That'll be the theme of our service and our lessons. Uh, our opening hymn this morning from your hymnals, uh, hymn number 782, Gracious God, You Send Great Blessings. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sins to God our Father. You may be seated or kneel for confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus, to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise.
Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In times past, now, and forevermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you are to be praised forever and ever. In your greatness, you have provided for us beyond measure. Cause our hearts to acknowledge you as creator and giver of all that is good, that we may then, in turn, manage those gifts, not as we would will to do so, but as you would have us use them. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who, with you and the Holy Spirit, are one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In response to God's word, we join together making profession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As Larry and I mentioned before worship, we are talking this month about stewardship. 
as we do usually every October. And I can see by the dull looks on your faces, you are all thrilled, and people watching online have decided whether or not to click me off already. Why is pastor talking about money again? Every October. I know why the government wants my money. I know why the kids want my money. And now the church. Why are we talking about money again? And I have to be honest. Many pastors dread talking about it as well partly because of many misguided and corrupt preachers who have ruined the topic. Pasta needs a new airplane. How can we ever talk about it? There's a reason. There's a very important reason that we do it every year and are very intentional about doing it every year. Now, there is a practical and community need to do it. We've committed voluntarily to be a local church congregation. As members, we make a voluntary commitment to support our ongoing work together. We are a part of the church. We commit to being part of the church and part of that work and supporting that work. Our church feeds hungry people, teaches children, people of all ages. We reach out in love to countless people and provide for worship and education and fellowship and in service. And yes, to do that, there are bills to be paid. There's salaries to be paid. To do the work of a church, we need money. But if that's the only reason that we talk about stewardship, we've kind of missed the point. And really, we've become no different than the Boy Scouts or a country club. All fine organizations, that's not the point. But church and in stewardship are something more. You see, there's a much more profound biblical, spiritual, eternal reason for talking about stewardship. My job as your pastor is to care for your souls. My primary concern is your relationship with God. Now, you may not like this, but money has a huge impact on that relationship. You see, money matters. The choir just sang the beautiful words of Jesus at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount. Where your treasure is, there so your heart shall be also. You see, as a pastor... If I'm concerned about your heart, about your soul, and I cannot really honestly do that and then simply ignore money in your life. Money is such a powerful thing and of such importance that how one decides to use their money tells volumes about who a person is, about what your values are, about where your hopes are anchored. Any person of faith who is honest and serious about examining your hearts, looking at your core values, and any pastor who is truly caring about your spiritual maturity, about your character, about your growth, must address money. If I'm going to care about your relationship with God, we have to talk about money because money matters. Money is a part of God's good gifts to us. My use of all that God has given me is a direct consequence of how I see myself as a steward, as a manager of what God has made. Do I see myself as one using what God has made as entrusted to my care? 
God created it. It all belongs to him. And how I relate to his creation really is a consequence of how I relate to God. The topic of money is very spiritual. Money matters. And each week we're going to look at why money matters. Today, thinking about it being a matter of motives. Why do you do what you do? Why do, as you look at your checkbook and look at your expenditures, why do you spend money the way you do? How I use money really, in the end, reveals motives. Am I motivated simply by fear? I'm so worried about my future that I spend a certain way or save a certain way. Am I motivated by greed and self-love and use that money simply to indulge myself? Do I spend out of guilt? Feeling bad about something I've done and trying to spend to make that feeling go away in myself or others? Is my use of money driven by my reputation? What will others think about me? And, and how do they see uh, how I use my money? You know, that's what's behind Jesus' words in, in our gospel lesson this morning. He's talking about people in, in the temple as they give their offerings. He says, be careful. Be careful about practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. So often we, we care. We, we care about what other people think. And we want them to see us doing the right thing. We want to be recognized and, and noticed for the good that we do. Jesus says, when you give to the needy, don't sound the trumpet, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets, that they may be praised by others. You see, he calls that practice hypocritical. Now, it's interesting. Why is that hypocrisy that I want to be noticed? Well, because I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. Am I giving to help someone? Or am I doing it to help myself? Let me explain. When that family loses everything in the fire or flood, am I doing it to help them or am I doing it to ease my guilty conscience or my uncertain feeling? When there's an appeal to give money to a needy family or to a cause to cure whatever, am I doing it because simply it's the right thing to do? Am I doing it to, to see that other people will see that I'm doing the right thing? Or am I doing it to help them? If nobody knew, nobody knew that I gave a, a single cent, if nobody knew that I did a tiny thing for them, would I still do it? Now we're at the heart of motives. Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, uh, talked about a, another church, another church in, in their motives. There was an appeal, appeal for an offering to the church back in, in Jerusalem, and they were gathering up offerings from all the other churches to take back to Jerusalem. Paul's commending the church in Corinth to, to complete uh, their offering, and in doing so, cites the church in Macedonia. And he notes about this church. This church has had a severe test of affliction. We don't know what it is, but something has really hurt them. 
Something has really gone wrong. He also notes that they've had extreme poverty. And yet this church gives. This church gives generously. This church gives beyond their means. This church begged to be a part of that offering. Why? Their abundance of joy welled up within them. You see, for them, this offering, this giving, wasn't motivated by greed or or guilt or fear or compulsion. It was joy. They were so joyful, even in the midst of all these things that were wrong, they found it a joy to give. Just as the people of the Old Testament, Moses says, as they lay these offerings before the Lord in the temple, you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you in your household. Giving is a matter of joy. Giving should be something that is celebrated and wells up from within me and overflows because of all of that goodness and gifts that God has given to me. I celebrate that. And from that place of joy, then I give. We celebrate. We give thanks. We are joyful because of God. Because of what God has done for me and what motivated God. Did you ever think that God has motives too? Look at the end of our reading from 2 Corinthians there, the last couple verses. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. For your sake. For your sake. What motivated God is you. Your well-being your life. You are so valuable to God that that as we're lost in in our sin and brokenness, God says, I'm going to give it up. I'm going to give up my pure nature of of being separate from creation, existing outside of time, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, and choose to live inside this creation, this sinful, broken creation, to live a life of of modest means, to die the death of a criminal for your sake, so that by his poverty you might become rich. You see, God wants you to be rich. Now, not in the way that Joel Osteen would claim it. It's not that God wants you to have money and and earthly wealth. God does want you, though, to be rich. Rich into all the gifts he earned on the cross. Forgiveness, grace, love, peace, hope. And when you have those gifts... And when that defines you and who you are, that will also motivate you then to live the life that God made and desired for you. That will motivate you to do what you do, to act the way you act, and to use all of your gifts and give the way you give. It is a spiritual matter. Stewardship is all about your relationship with your giving, loving God. 
It's important. It's important to, to look at money. To honestly ask yourself, what is motivating your use of money? Money matters. Because you matter to God. And it's a matter of motives. In Jesus' name, amen.